more cell transport. Getting more into what active and some other things, which are really, we really talked about in chemistry, kind of brought up before. So now we have active transport, and now we're going to need ATP. We're going to require ATP because we're going either moving large substances through or moving against the concentration gradient or something that's not move, able to move down a concentration. So we're going to need the ATP. And vesicular transport, you should know, is always active. Transport, endocytosis, exocytosis. So just some general terms to go through. Um, you have antiporters means like one substance is coming in and another one's going out, like the revolving door in a hotel. Like potassium going in, like there's usually two of them, or you know, two of them, and then sodium going out, the same channel. And there's usually three of them. Sorry, Na. There's usually three. Symporters are things going in the same direction. Like sometimes glucose and sodium come in together in some place like, like the kidney, All right? But if they're going against the concentration from low to high, repeat it over and over, that requires energy. That's gonna be a color charge to get in. Okay, so primary active transport, the energy comes right from ATP hydrolysis. So what's ATP hydrolysis? You take ATP, we use an enzyme called ATPase. And then you add water because it's hydrolysis. That's not an ion, it's adding water. Then you get ADP, adenosine diphosphate, plus that high energy inorganic phosphate. And there you go. And then there's secondary active transport is getting the ATP indirectly or the energy indirectly, usually by another reaction, another transport that's going on. So that could be like you helping the guy get through the revolving door. You use his energy, even though you're going against the current, if you like that metaphor. Okay, energy from hydrolysis of ATP. You should always remember that because it's going to come back and on the departmental final, there'll be questions like that too. I want to get you guys ready for that as well as best I can, okay? So shape changes causes ions bound to protein to be pumped. So sometimes the protein has to change shape to get things through. That's a pump, calcium pumps. Calcium pumps are used. Again, we're probably not gonna talk a lot about that here because it's more in cardiovascular. Calcium pumps is calcium you really need for muscle contraction. So the more calcium you pump into a muscle, like a heart muscle, the stronger the contraction. Then you have the proton pumps, like in your stomach, you know, when you have all that acid in your stomach and you take like the little blue pill, like uh, Tagament or oh, I forget the name of the one that's given, you, given to you for acid stomach. So it stops the proton pumps. They're called proton pump inhibitor. I forget the Nexium is an example. So, because if you have too much protons, you're gonna get too much HCL and that's acid, which you want in your stomach to a certain extent. But if it's too much, then it can cause symptoms like pain in your epigastric region. Remember the epigastric region from lab? You gotta know that for the practical that's coming up. When that is, is pretty open, opens up on Chelsea's birthday, actually, that's how I remember it. Okay, and you have the sodium potassium pumps, which really is an ATPase pump. That's kind of like, it doesn't have to be an antiporter though, but it usually is an antiporter, like the revolving door, one guy going one way, one gal going the other, working off that energy, pumping in and out. And the membrane would be the hotel door. Okay. So sodium potassium pumps are pretty much on every cell membrane. They use a lot of energy for this. It costs, costs a lot of energy, these pumps, part of your BMR. So it's pretty much everywhere, especially on the, the nerve. And uh, did I mention this nerve and muscle? This is where you guys live and girls live in a &P one here at CCM. We do cardio in a &P two. So you got to know these excitable membranes. That means you, know, you got sodium on the outside and it's very positive and negative on the inside. That creates a lot of excitation, potential excitation. But when sodium comes in, 
all hell breaks loose and the party could start. You have depolarization. So there's potassium inside the cell more commonly. So pumping this potassium back in and the sodium out kind of repolarizes the membrane, which you're gonna see. Polarization is the opposites, right? So negative, I'm sorry, positive versus negative, and that polarizes the membrane. So again, I always talk about that here because it's this is where you're gonna live. Leakage channels, I mentioned this, this is kind of going with the gradient, down the gradient. Um, and what you should know here is that sodium, is, well, potassium leaks into the cell more than sodium, leak, I'm sorry, potassium leaks out of the cell more than sodium leaks in. Because it, it wants to maintain that polarity for a while because that, that's really what builds up the potential for excitation. Sounds a little bit complicated and it, it won't be by the time we get there, I promise. Okay, so it maintains that electrochemical gradient. So this is primary active transport, which ATP is directly hydro hydrolyzed to move things against like sodium, potassium pump here's in a great example. Sodium is more prevalent on the outside. So moving sodium out takes energy. Potassium is more abundant inside the cell. So it takes more energy to move potassium into the cell. And that's primary active transport based on direct hydrolysis of ATP. So let's play a little slideshow. Let's mess around. Let's play. This will be quick. So quick and things up for you guys. Let's see how this works. So you see, you start out with kind of like a, I don't want to say isotonic, but you see there's more potassium on the inside, more sodium on the outside. So it's harder to move the sodium outside and the potassium back in. So you have to hydrolyze that ATP to move that through. So technically that's an antiporter and it's a pump. So that kind of gives you the both uh, view on that. A little slideshow, that was fun. Okay, now vesicles, they're formed based on the membrane. So they have mem vesicles like little spaceships that have membranes that contain something. And it usually requires energy and it always requires energy. And for our purposes, it's using ATP or at least the hydrolysis of ATP in one way or another, directly or indirectly. So they're transporting large molecules or large particles and macromolecules like your amino acids, your carbohydrates sometimes and the Golgi apparatus can wrap these up like a post office, these little vesicles, and help move them to the membrane where they're gonna either be, stay in the membrane or they're gonna be released through exocytosis. That takes energy pretty much all the time. So endocytosis is the phagocytosis, the eating. Phago means to engulf. Pinocytosis is like mass phagocytosis, like more like cell drinking, but bringing in, right? Endo means into. Then you have receptor-mediated endocytosis, which is the way a, a white blood cell would work. But they have specific receptors. Like hopefully, after you get vaccinated, you'll have the receptors for COVID-19. So you, you'll have a, a, a built-in attack when somebody takes their mask off in Chick-fil-A or something later on this spring. Okay, and then exocytosis is exo-leaving the cell and this takes energy as well, right? Across and out of the cell, like a neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. That's the one you're gonna know the most about. Acetylcholine is so massively abundant in our bodies. Vesicular trafficking, vesicular trafficking. Sounds like something you see on Breaking Bad. So that's transport from one area or an organelle within the cell. So it's like a little city, right, going on in there. So the vesicles bringing the, from the Golgi apparatus back to the endoplasmic reticulum to make more proteins if we need them. Depends on the necessity of the cell and the physiology of the cell, which mirrors the anatomy, right? So here's more endocytosis. And they're basically protein coated vesicles. And that kind of makes them hydrophilic, right? And more polar, which helps out with the membranes and usually involve receptors, therefore could be a selectively movable part of process. 
So it has to be bind to a specific receptor. And receptors are always specific, sometimes called unique. Look at this. this is, now this, this takes us away from the nuts and bolts. Some pathogens like um, bacteria, virus like COVID-19, they can hijack a receptor and kind of masquerade as that cell and, and transfer RNA from the pathogen to the cell and change the DNA in that cell, which is really scary, especially something like HIV. It's exactly how that works on your helper T cells. So again, sometimes the immune system overworks and these pathogens, even cancer, could pretty much hijack the, I like that word, hijacking. Trafficking and hijacking is like a Showtime series on Sunday night. So lysosome, that's the suicide sac, will actually help destroy it. But then what happens with these viruses, the cells don't look like they need to be destroyed. They look normal to the immune system, to the rest of the immune system. And inside the cell seems normal because they hijack that. That RNA really is what they hijack to make it look like it's, your, it's part of your body. And transcytosis is basically changing and sometimes destroying in appropriate situations. So here's a little endocytosis. You see the ingestion into the membrane and you're forming of the vesicles. And then along comes the lysosome and they, they, they call this a vacuum. It's like a garbage can vesicle and then they could destroy it. And it, sometimes you wanna get rid of the substances that are in the vesicles, like not just neurotransmitter, but something that has to leave the cell maybe some garbage like in an airplane when you throw the waste out, like bad proteins or underused or unnecessary DNA, whatever's in that nucleus, RNA, I should say, because DNA never leaves the nucleus. So it could be other types of proteins mostly. So phagocytosis is important for us because that's really where the macrophage comes in. The big eater, right? Macrophage, we'll talk about that tomorrow, I'm sure. And we'll talk about it in lecture. So macrophage is a tissue phagocyte, which destroys anything that looks foreign, right? It's part of the inflammation, an inflammatory process when something uh, foreign comes into the body, like a bee sting or a cut that's infected bacteria, right? Or um, parasite or some other type of pathogen. So it's pulled into the cell and the vesicle kind of changes name to a phagosome. That's all that means, all right? So macrophages are a big deal with this. So macrophage is more in the tissue where white blood cells, you learn white blood cell types, I guess in AP2, the five white blood cell types. But macrophage is a more tissue cell. White blood cells are in the bloodstream. They be, some become macrophages, which you'll learn. So amoeboid motion is just the way they kind of swim around. And really important that they kind of congregate where you need them. So here's something, this could be, who knows, this could be a, a virus right here, a cancer cell, a virus more likely, and you have receptors on the membrane that you can get a memory of if you get vaccinated. And then bringing that in, and then the phagosome eventually will be lysed thanks to the help of the lysosome. So I always like the lysosome. Don't talk a lot about pinocytosis. That's like more engulfing through massive cell drinking or fluid endocytosis. So it brings in some of the fluid if necessary. And this utilizes an endosome. Not that important for us right there. This is important, receptor mediated endocytosis. And it has this claret and coated pits, which kind of internalize everything, bring everything into the vesicle. And you have the en enzymes will try to destroy it. Now these are called uh, examples in LDL, low density lipoprotein, which carries a lot of cholesterol. And we don't want a lot of these in our blood because they destroy the lining of our blood vessels because the macrophage is gonna see this and the macrophage is gonna get involved with trying to clean this up. So it creates more inflammation. Inflammation is very dangerous to our blood vessels and our cardiovascular system. So this is cholesterol carrier and iron, excess iron 
also could be a problem. And insulin and unfortunately viruses, you know that diphtheria, um, which is another infection, cholera, talking about cholera, which is a really bad bacteria that came out in the 1800s. So hopefully we don't see, we get vaccinated for diphtheria, but cholera, I don't know why this is brought up here. Thank God that's not around. Don't worry about the caviole. Okay, get too deep into, because immune system we could talk about for another three hours. So really what we want to know here is this, what receptor mediated endocytosis is. So there's receptors on the membranes for these antigens after all, especially when it comes to inoculations and vaccinations. So it's important that we have the memory of that as we build receptors from our DNA. Exocytosis, nice picture here. Look at squirting out all the hopefully neurotransmitter. This is the cell membrane, great micrograph here. So here's the vesicle. And this is the contents of the vesicle being excreted. It takes energy and this is active. And that's really the takeaway here. So I've been talking about this for a while, the resting membrane potential, right? That's the difference in polarization between the inside and outside of the cell. So the electrical charge is the negative and positive part. So the inside of the cell is much more negative relative to the outside. So Again, I can draw this a million times. This is the one, this is going into the Cloisters Museum up on Henry Hudson Parkway, probably by Monday. So again, get this down. We got the inside of the cell is very negative charge. And this is because of the negatively charged proteins that are inside the cell, the phosphates that are negatively charged. So potassium doesn't do anything to change this polarity. And then outside of the cell is very positive. So it's like, it's like going to a, like a, flat, a frat house, right? And all the guys are inside, they're negatively charged and all the girls are outside and they're positively charged. And this is a resting membrane potential. It's excitable, but it's not exciting yet. But then what happens if there's a stimulus that changes this? What that does is sends the sodium in so the inside of the membrane becomes more positive. And now it's depolarized. So the resting membrane potential inside the cell could be like, say, minus 70 millivolts to start. But then you, you get it up to like, say, minus 55 millivolts. And then all hell breaks loose and it gets more positive and then you get to plus 30. And that, my friends, is called an action potential. That's a mixer. That's a party. And that's all or nothing. That shoots down a neuron or a muscle membrane that creates a lot of change like muscle contraction or nerve conduction. Sometimes you want to suppress an action potential too. You don't always want this to happen. Sometimes you want to make the membrane even more polarized and like say to 100 minus millivolts. And that would suppress an action potential. And you need that sometimes. So you, again, we'll learn that in neuro. You spend a lot of time in the nervous system. So potassium is a key player in resting the membrane potential. And that's why I said that there are much more leak channels for potassium than there is for sodium. Because if potassium leaves the cell, picture this, right? Let me draw this again. Let's go back to the museum. I should charge for this kind of artwork. So again, potassium is more prevalent on the inside, right? Even though it's say, minus 70 millivolts on the inside. But if the potassium channels, either, either leak channels or channels are open for potassium, it's gonna make the potassium come out and it's gonna get more positive. So now the membrane potential can go to like minus 90 or minus 100. And this heavier polarization is gonna inhibit an action potential which is okay, but again, it helps get back to resting membrane potential. And that's what you want. You wanna get a nerve cell or muscle cell to get back to its resting membrane potential, which is around minus 70 millivolts on the inside. That's very negative compared to the outside. So potassium has a big role player. It's the potassium leaving the cell that really creates that. 
And they're going to hear a term called repolarization. And that has everything to do with potassium. So why not talk about it now a little bit? And here it is, like the resting member of potentials are at minus 70 millivolts. So potassium is more permeable in the membrane, definitely more than sodium, because you don't want like sodium leaking in, because that makes your nerves and muscles a little too jumpy, because you want to get them back to resting membrane potential so they can start up a new action potential. So chloride doesn't really come into play with a resting membrane potential. So here, I think we have a little, this is a good picture showing you, you know, much more potassium on the inside, negative charges on the inside, right? Positive on the outside because of all the sodium. So potassium and chloride make no difference. I mean, potassium adds to the polarity, obviously, but with a little bit of chloride and the ECF doesn't really make a difference. So remember, outside of the cell, much more positively charged, mostly because of all the sodium that's there. And this is the resting membrane potential, which is like minus 70 millivolts until there's a stimulus, which depolarizes it. So it's polarized. It's polarized, right? It's polarized, positive, the girls on the outside, guys on the inside, negative, frat party. I think we've got a slideshow here. This speeds up the, the lecture a little bit. Let's do this. How does this look? Yeah. Potassium moving into the cell. That's easy. That, this, that might make it a little bit less negative. So if potassium moves out, it's going to be more negative. Really. That's what's going to happen there. Oh, that was a quick show. So it's good to think, start thinking about the resting membrane potential, right? And the sodium potassium pump kind of helps maintain that because it's really pumping the sodium out. And it's three sodiums to two potassiums for the sodium potassium ATPase pump because it's active transport against the gradients. Okay. So this is all about chemical signaling. We're not going to go into that. G protein receptors, I think we'll talk about that when we get there, because this is a real big topic right here and it's really more neuro. And this has to do with especially something like binding epinephrine when you need a, a second messenger. And I'm not gonna go into that. Now I think we're gonna save that for neuro. So where do we end? We ended at the sodium potassium pump and the leakage pump. So we're ending at the, um, resting membrane potential and what that basically means. Okay, and that's where we'll end it. And we'll start 